the playoffs. The Warriors need to play on Friday. What a thriller here at the Staples Center. Good day. Welcome to First Take on this Friday Eve. Stephen A. Smith, Max Kellerman, I'm Molly Karam Rose. Um, gentlemen, heck of a game. Tied up until the final seconds of scoring champ Steph Curry dropping 37, keeping the game competitive without his fellow Splash Brother, and then beyond impressive, but that shot from 34 feet all the way downtown. LeBron James doing LeBron James things so clutch. And I want to focus on that ridiculous three at the buzzer. Mr. Smith. Is he? Okay. Stephen A., is the shot lucky? Hell yeah, it was luck. I mean, I'm not knocking him for it. Great lucky things happen for great, great, great players. And we all know that LeBron James is an all-time great. Uh, He's hit four shots beyond 30 feet all season long. Uh, Obviously, this was one of them. Give him credit where credit is due. Uh, Steph Curry, you know, sunk in. They, you know, they, they obviously LeBron James threw the ball to Contavious Caldwell Pope down in the post, um, thinking that, you know what, you could get a bucket that way. Steph Curry collapsed. He, did, he thought that LeBron was out of the play, et cetera. And then the next thing you know, KCP just kicked it back out to LeBron, and he hailed it, you know, as the shot clock was winding down. It was damn near hell, Mary, for crying out loud. But nevertheless, he made it, and that's what great players do. Great players make great things happen from time to time. But I thought the shot itself was lucky primarily because of how LeBron James was shooting the ball pretty much in the first half. In the second half, he made a couple of spots. He he made a couple of shots, and obviously he was far more efficient, hitting 6 of 10 overall. Uh, But the first half was awful, and just watching him gimp a little bit and watching the way that he was shooting the ball, um, you could tell it was going to be a difficult night for him. Uh, but in this particular instance, I thought the shot was was lucky, but I'm not taking anything away from him. Everybody, I mean, a little bit of luck comes with everything. And I think he you, had it last night. If you, This was not about luck, Stephen A. If you want to say he was lucky, he's lucky like Tom Brady gets lucky. Let me tell you what I was thinking. In the final minute of that game, I was thinking the exact same thing I was thinking in the fourth quarter when Drew Brees and Tom Brady linked up this year in the playoffs, I thought, okay, Drew, this man's got six. You've got one. It's a tie game. It's the fourth quarter. You've beaten them twice in the regular season. You're going to make enough plays to win right now? Because I know this. Brady will. Brady's not going to lose it for himself. He's going to make enough plays to win. Are you? And the answer was no. And that's why Brady's the GOAT and Brees is not, even though he's the most accurate passer of all time, right? Now, Steph Curry, like Breeze, is the most accurate guy of all time. From When he shoots the ball, he's more accurate than anyone who ever lived. But he's not the GOAT. He's not the best player in the game today, nor has he ever been. And in the final minute of that game, I was thinking this is the reason why when LeBron didn't have Kyrie or Kevin Love, he still took Steph when he was crewed up six games, and they gave the MVP to Iguodala because they had to give it to the guy playing defense on LeBron who was actually the best player. This is the reason LeBron beat the Steph Curry 73-win team. This is the reason Steph and the Warriors needed KD to get past LeBron. This is the reason LeBron has played in 10 finals and won four, sometimes his team's badly overmatched but still competitive because of him. And this is the reason Steph has played in five finals, has yet to win a finals MVP. I'm not knocking Steph. He's an all-time great, just like Drew Brees. But among the all-time greats, there are levels. And if you want to attribute that to luck, go ahead. But I knew in the last minute of that game, LeBron's going to make plays. Steph, can you make enough plays to beat him? The answer was no. I'm not going to call that luck. Well, you don't have to. I don't need your permission to call it luck, and that's what I believe it was. I'm only talking about that shot. I'm not talking about his overall play. I'm just talking about that one shot. That's number one. Number two, we're talking about there's levels to this. Let's keep in mind that, in, you know, particularly with Golden State's last possession, uh, they were all, uh, the Lakers were all over at three guys just denying the ball to Steph Curry, making sure that no matter what, he didn't get to touch the ball. Any of y'all shoot if y'all want to. Let's just make sure Steph Curry doesn't get the damn ball. Nowhere. You had three guys surrounding him damn near at midcourt just to shield him from getting the ball and just left everybody else open to shoot because that's how lethal Steph Curry can be. That's how lethal he was last night. That's how lethal he's been pretty much this entire season. So when you say stuff like there's levels to this, let's not act 
like Steph Curry is not on a certain level, even comparable yes. to LeBron. LeBron James. No, not I think comparable he is. to LeBron. Stop, no. oh, He's not comparable to LeBron, and he never has been. Go ahead, go ahead and let's, talk. Let's go, be, go ahead, let's let's be go ahead real talk. about I'm it. I'm telling you right now, you're talking to America. I'm not listening to you. I'm not listening to you That's tell me problem. that the greatest That's shooter the on the planet, problem. the I'll greatest shooter on the planet Earth, who's a three-time yeah. champion, is not on the level of a LeBron James. I'm not He's listening not to that. He's not go on the level. You're going to talk. Are you, you going to talk? Listen, I'm well, going to read. This is a way I, I to wish I had a novel with me. I'd be reading that right they now. Have I'm not listening to this. Plenty of not times this. When, with the chips on the line, Stephen A., the first time they did, who was the best player on either team and was it close? The first time they linked up in 2015 in the finals, LeBron was twice as good as Steph. He was so much better, it was embarrassing. That's why even though Steph's team won, they don't like to give it to the, to the player on the losing team, even if it's second best player is Matthew Della Vadova. So they had to say, okay, who play? Okay, I guess Iguodala played defense on LeBron. Let's give it to him. Was he on LeBron's level then? No. The next year, they won 73 games. Steph was a unanimous MVP. But when it mattered most, if his team would have won, Draymond Green was going to get MVP. That's two years in a row. If I had right? a newspaper, I'd be reading it. LeBron James won and won MVP. If I, had newspaper, that's two. I, if I had a newspaper, I'd two. be reading it. The greatest <laughs> then, shooter in the history of then, basketball. That's right. He's not on this level. It's a no, three-time no, champion. He's not on LeBron's but, level. A two-time league MVP. There are what levels. Please, Max, I have a question please, for you when you're done. Please. By, and you're by the way, then, they, then you want to give him credit for beating right. LeBron twice in the finals in consecutive years? Ridiculous. They added KD to a 73-win team. There was no chance. Who won MVP in those, in those series? I mean, it should have been LeBron, by the way. But they gave it to KD. KD Molly, was the best player on this. the team. I don't know you if want you to say this, KD's Molly. on I'm really level. serious about you telling you argument. I'm not listening I to Max on this. I have Not even a little bit. Talk to me. Not even a little yeah. bit. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Let me ask you this, though, Max, because I was very impressed, and I was very surprised the game was so close. Mm. Were you not impressed from Steph from the standpoint, we're talking about a LeBron James team with Anthony Davis. He mm. had no Clay Thompson, and that he kept it that close down to the wire? Oh, yeah. Steph's a very impressive player. He's an, like, he's an all-time great there are, there are inner sanctums, even in the inner sanctum of the Hall of Fame, right? There's a handful of guys in the conversation for greatest player ever. LeBron is in that conversation. Steph is not. And there are levels, as I just said. Of course, Steph was impressive. And the Warriors were impressive. I, I will remind people that the Lakers haven't been healthy or played together in a long time. Basically, the whole second half of the season. And had that been the case, that they had continuity and health, I don't think it would have been that close. But going in, we knew that was the case. And by the way, Stephen A., you and I both said the Lakers win a squeaker. And they did. And why did we say that? Because they have LeBron. Switch, put Steph on the Lakers and LeBron on the Warriors. Guess what? The Warriors win a, sque a squeaker. Stephen A., can I ask you a question before we go to break? Because I know you're, you're done with Max, but hopefully yeah. you'll, still, you'll still talk totally to me. Totally done with him on this subject. <laughs> okay. I mean, uh, by, by the way, Molly, I would yeah. like to keep in mind, you mm -hmm. know, I, how many times have I brought up how Giannis was the best player in the world and then over the weekend he dropped to number five? Mm -hmm. How many times have I brought up how, how Max is bloviating about Kawhi Leonard for years and then when he's proven wrong, he Here. said, oops. He said, oops, and let's move on to the next subject. You know, this is this, this kind of nonsense. I know, nonsense. you get frustrated. You I, I have, I have, I, 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 actually, it's, it's, right. it's embarrassing listening to him when talk about stuff. It really can is. Can My opinion just, changed. Just, just, what do you do? Right, what right. you say is, I'm not ahead, listening. Can I get the I'm not listening. I'm not listening. I'm not done. I'm Guys, just done. Go ahead, Molly. Work with me, please. Work with me. Love you both. Uh, Stephen A., speaking of consistency, after last night, do you still think Steph is the best player in the world? I think this season, the last three months, he's played like the best player in the world. That's what I said. I never said he was the best player in the world, period. I said over the last three months, he has played like the best player in the world, and I don't think, it's, I don't think anybody can deny it. He's been absolutely sensational, really reminding us that he's the greatest shooter on planet Earth, the greatest shooter that has ever been created. That's, that's number one. He's the league leader in scoring at 32 points a game. He shot better than 49% from the field, better than 42% from three-point range. He hasn't had Klay Thompson. I'm going to go as far as to say this. It is already a foregone conclusion in my mind that if Klay Thompson returns healthy next year, Golden State Warriors are going to be in the conference finals. Golden State Warriors. If Klay Thompson was there last night, this might have been a blowout. They might have took the Lakers out convincingly. Damn shame that he wasn't, he wasn't there. I love me some Draymond Green. I'm a huge fan of Draymond Green because I understand the game and the intangibles that he brings to the table, and he was exceptional defensively. Um, and, and obviously the assist and knowing who to get the ball to and when, whether it's Steph Curry.
very, very promising player. That Draymond Green deserves a boatload of credit. But you cannot go scoreless in 41 minutes on the court. You can't do that, Draymond Green. You got to score. Draymond Green's got to score 10 to 12 points a game for this team to really, really have a chance. Uh, th th I'm talking about to actually win. The bottom line is this. Steph Curry... What he has done and the load that he has carried by himself to have the Golden State Warriors in this position, as far as I'm concerned, right now, he looks like the best player in the world. And let me be very clear. We all know he looked like the best player on the court last night. We all know that. Until it if mattered you watch most. the game, yeah. it was, he was most. the best no, player, LeBron was the best on, the player on the court last, last night. night. That's not even right. LeBron was also playing defense. He's a defense. Like, LeBron was, was a version of Steph and a version of Draymond last night. As usual, he was the best player on the court. It's not even right. But let me just say this. Was Steph the best player in the world over the second half of the season? Yes, he was. Over the second half of this year, last month and a half especially, he was the best well, player in the world. Last two, three months? Yeah, three, in the three. regular season. Why was that? LeBron was hurt. Harden was hurt. KD was hurt. Those three guys better than Steph. They were all hurt. Okay, now let's talk about the entire season. Is, is Steph going to win MVP? No. You know who is? Jokic. You know why? He was better. He was a little better. They were both healthy all season. Jokic is a little better. He's going to win MVP. You know who would have won MVP if he would have stayed healthy other than the three guys I mentioned? Joel Embiid. He would have been better overall. He just didn't play enough games. So was Steph the best player in the world over the last, let's say, I'll split the difference with you, two months of this year in the absence of three players better than him? Yes, he was. That's Ain't as that much as I you said? can say. Ain't that what I said? I said over the last couple of months, he's played yeah. like the best player in the world. But let's Ain't not that what I said? Out. I think that's what I said. I think you that's said what I said. Over that's the, the last three the, months that's is the, exactly that's, what that's, you that's said. The, that's number but one. But you left no, out some big, the, some big that's details. That's number didn't you? one. Number two, just because those players were hurt doesn't take away from what Steph did himself against the competition. I'm not saying that James Harden would not have been sensational, Joel Embiid would not have been sensational, or uh, uh, Jokic, Jokic rather, or LeBron. I'm not saying any of that. What I'm saying is we know what we saw from him. And because of what we saw from him, even if those guys were balling, because you got Kyrie and Kevin Durant as your teammates and you're sharing the basketball with them and doing a lot of great things. If you're Giannis and Budenholzer is, is, is tweaking your game to some degree to get you set for playoff basketball, we're not questioning their overall abilities. We're not questioning what they would have done. I'm just saying we saw what he did and what he did at that particular moment in time over the last two or three months was the best basketball in that span we've seen this year. The best. Mm, mm. That's what I'm saying. Uh, because, of the many... because, because of the accuracy and the consistency with which he was doing it. No, I would say the best basketball we saw played this year was by James Harden before he got At hurt. Time, once he that, joined right. the Nets. That was the, yeah. Someone said, what's the highest level of basketball we saw played, period? James Harden this year was the highest level of basketball we if saw you take played. Into, if you're taking into account your selflessness, your ability yeah. to run a team, have assist along with points. But I'm just saying, when you look at Steph Curry, the shots that were falling, where they were falling from, the accuracy with which he was producing, and the fact that he was propelling a Golden State Warriors team as a one-man show. And I would know something about one-man shows because I covered one for 10 years in Allen Iverson, okay? And, and, and he was a one-man wrecking crew for the Philadelphia uh, 76ers on going the other side of the board. He's an Colin. undersized guy, you and know, I saw what, it. When James Harden didn't have KD, he just had Kyrie, he was winning. When he didn't have Kyrie, he I'm just had... I'm not questioning had, anything about James Harden. He just James had KD, Harden. he was winning. When he didn't have We're either one of them, he was winning. We're not questioning anything about those guys. We're not he was questioning doing the same anything thing. about those guys. All right, let's move this conversation forward. Stephen A., I have a question for you. With Clay Thompson, how many teams in the West and which teams are better than the Warriors? With Clay Thompson? Yes, when, think of Clay Thompson returning, hypothetical here. Honestly speaking, with Klay Thompson, a healthy mm -hmm. Klay Thompson, yes, sir. the only team I'd give a chance as being definitively better is a healthy Los Angeles Lakers with LeBron James and, and AD. And I don't even know if that's so. Because the two, the two, two of the top five greatest shooters the game has ever seen on the court together, they're just lethal. Now, they hurt you in different ways than LeBron and AD can hurt you. And we know that 
But these dudes are marksmen. Oh, by the way, LeBron is a liability compared to them from the free throw line. Oh, by the way, these two both religiously shoot better than 40% from three-point range. And Klay Thompson is one of the elite defenders. He can defend three, four positions on the court as a 6'7 shooting guard. We can't ignore that. You partner him with the greatest shooter this game has ever seen, with him being a top five shooter of all time himself. How are we going to sit there and summarily dismiss anybody, anybody with the Warriors? I look at the Warriors with Klay Thompson, and I say the only team that I would def- I-, I-, I could sit up there and say, hey, they might be better is LeBron and AD. And that's a maybe because of how lethal Clay and Steph are together shooting the basketball. It's even worse than that, actually. Yes, the addition of Clay Thompson makes them very, very good because Wiggins really developed as a player. And we haven't even mentioned Wiseman, by the way. But it's worse than that because they also have the T-Wolves pick, which is going to be a very high pick. So actually, the Warriors are also better positioned to make a trade for an available superstar than any team in the league. With that pick, Wiseman, and if they wanted to, Wiggins, whether they keep Wiggins and now they have the athletic two-way player to go with Clay and Steph, right? Or they package him with a pick with Wiseman, who, who knows with what, to, to make a major move. The Warriors will likely, there's a really good chance that they field the most talented team, at least in the Western Conference, next year. All of those things are true. I don't disagree with any of those points. I'm just saying that in the end, listen, I'm looking at Jordan Poole. Like, Andrew Wiggins showed me something once upon a time. I said uh, just a few months ago, wouldn't give him away for a box of cookies. I wasn't talking about his talent. I was just talking about the fact that he doesn't produce when it counts. He produced last night. Played some really good defense against LeBron James. He dropped about 21 points. Wasn't anywhere to be found in the clutch moments, but that's because they were looking for Steph, as they should have been. I was impressed with what it would, Wiggins showed up. If he showed up like that every day, I would feel far more confident about him because I know he's got the skills. It's the want it factor, the want it factor that I question about him on far too many nights. But I don't question that about Jordan Poole. I like this kid. And when I think about Clay and Steph coming back together, Wiseman is better than Ja Ja Pajulia was or Andrew Bogut was, at least offensively and defensively. He's got some promise. And so mm-hmm. when I look at it from that perspective, I expect fully the Golden State Warriors, so long as they're healthy, the Golden State Warriors will be in the conference finals last next year. At the Here's very the other- least, they probably might come out the West. Here's the other thing about the Lakers real quick since we're spinning it forward on the Warriors. You know what I noticed last night? No playoff Rondo. Rondo's not on the team anymore, and Schroeder is a better regular season player than Rondo. But, in, but last night I thought he was a jag. He was just a guy. Not a bad player. Just, he was just a guy. He's a team. He's a Rondo run a team. is a floor general and all-star when you need him most, and the Lakers did not have that third guy like that last night. All right, we will leave it there. The Lakers get the Suns next. LeBron has never lost a first-round series in his career. Still to come, y'all. Are, um, the best of the best. And, uh, you know, going into that, if, if I'm a fan, I, you know, and just a general fan of the NBA, I, don't, I see, have been a hard time seeing them lose. So we're going to have to play great. We're going to have to play great together. And, um, you know, we're going to have to be really, really sound on both ends of the floor. Okay, so you heard that right. Prior to Saturday's opening round of the playoffs where Brad Stevens Celtics face the Brooklyn Nets, Brad said he's having a hard time seeing the Nets lose. Our basketball power index says it's an advantage Nets in the series. BPI gives Brooklyn a 78% chance to win. The Nets won all three regular season meetings against the Celtics this year. On that note, we bring in former Celtic Kendrick Perkins. Hey, Perk, saw you yesterday. I watched you on Stephen A. Sports Center, Guys, I watched the full show um, for an hour. You did a great job. I was very entertained, so it was nice to see you out there in L.A. Uh, Thank you. I appreciate it. Molly, hey, look, I was a rookie <coughs> up there with two legends. You know, hey, it was kind of hard to hold my own, but I think I did all right. He did you, good. You he did a great good. job. <laughs> He was and a huge rookie. Congrats I did, I, to he was Will a Bond. rookie. He was a rookie. I still got on him a little bit more on a couple of things, but he did. Yeah. I. yeah. I didn't know where your dress shoes were, Stephen A., but I was going to save that for off the air. But since we're having the my conversation what? now, my your what? dress shoes. 
Next oh, week, I'd they, like they, to see they, you have dress they, shoes they, on. They, there, was some, there was some fly sneakers I was rocking last night, some yeah. Christian Louboutins. No, rock. they were nice. Out but, in LA, but, Emily, you got to put the sneakers but, on. Stephen A., if you're going to wear the tie, I need to see dress shoes. If you're going to do no tie, you can do the Louboutins. We'll I know you going. ain't saying that to me with all of these folks at ESPN walking around with sneakers all the time. I wear them like 1% of the time. These guys walking around with sneakers every day, please. And their sneakers I, are whack. I hold you to Mine's a higher standard. Good. Hold you to a higher standard, okay? Okay, uh, I can perk, go with that. I'm starting with you. Should Celtics players, you were a Celtics player, feel motivated or embarrassed by those comments? He doesn't see how his team's going to win? Well, I mean, I mean, look, Brad Stevens, if you love, if you love Brooklyn that much, won't you go coach him? Go join the coaching staff. Listen, I played for the Boston Celtics for eight and a half years, all right? I know the definition is the city of champions. They have something that's called Celtic pride. That wasn't Celtic pride. And, no, I wouldn't want to play with Brad Stevens. I cannot go to war with a coach that is sitting up here praising and glorifying an opponent that I'm, I possibly could upset. How about going in – how about saying, hey – we're going to be prepared. We're going to be parade ready. I know y'all crowning them, but I got enough, and we're going to come to compete. How about saying that, Brad Stevenson? I mean, goddamn, Wick Grosbeck, Steve Pagliuga, Danny Ainge, my guys, this is what we come to? And then, you know, hearing around from the whole Boston area, they like Big Perk. Brad is just a good guy. He's just soft-spoken. He's not in his demeanor. What? Like? What are we talking about? We're trying to win championships. Like, get some fire up under you. Right now, you should be telling the team, let's go shock the world. You got Jason Tatum, a man who just dropped 50, 50 points the other night in a crucial moment. You still got Kimber Walker. You still got some guys that could go out there and compete and, and compete in this series with the Brooklyn Nets. I mean, it was just disturbing. I tried to... You know, get down with Brad because people, you know, I think he's good with X's and O's, but this right here took me over the top. I'm sorry. A lot of people may not like what I said, but I really don't give a damn, but that was just disturbing to hear. Here I am about to go to war in the series, and I hear my coach going on there and praising and giving flowers like he want to be part of the coaching staff of the Brooklyn Nets. It's completely unacceptable. Well, Kendrick Perkins, I'd say to you that, um, you know, number one, I don't agree with you. And the reason I don't agree with you is because of you. Uh, your reaction to it, if you feel that way, I hope the rest of the Boston Celtics feel that way. Because if they feel that way, then Brad Stevens might have achieved what he was after. Basically given the impression you got no chance. I mean, if you really look at his quote, think about it. He said, if I'm just a general fan, I have a hard time seeing them lose. Well, he's not just a general fan. He's the head coach of the Boston Celtics. So you got to parse words with this, KP. He said, if I'm a general's fan, but he's the head coach of the Boston Celtics. So he's plotting and planning for a way to get around it, even without the services of Jalen Brown. Look, guys, everybody's stacked. All the odds are stacked against us. Everybody believes that we don't have a snowball's chance in hell. Hell, if I was a fan, I'd be that way too. But I'm the coach, and you're the players. And we could go out here and make history, and we could ruin their season. Here's what we wouldn't need to do. And you go about the business of doing it that way. I really don't think it's that big of a deal. Uh, what he did, uh, but seeing your reaction, Kendrick Perkins, is what gets me to that point. Yeah, look, this is that was going to be my point, Perk. Like, I, I, but but let me let me let me let me take it to another level here. Um, the, if I were a fan, thing is clear that he's not saying he's a fan. He's saying if I saw it from the outside, I would think these dudes don't have a chance. The question is, Perk, why say it at all? What could he's just being honest? Is he that naive? Is he that stupid? He hasn't been around the league, hasn't been to three conference finals. He, he, just, he just blurts it out. No, that's by design. So what could the purpose be? What don't you want to give the other team? You never want to give the other team bulletin board, or nowadays they call it whiteboard material, right? Don't give it to the other team. Why? Because it motivates them. Don't say something that's going to get under their skin unless, as Stephen A. points out, you're Michael Jordan and you're so psychotically competitive, you actually want to motivate the other team to beat them at their best. Most coaches don't want to give the other team motivation. So if you, if you don't want to give the other team motivation it's because it's bad for you, surely you do want to give it to your own team. And as Stephen A. points out, look at your 
reaction. They now want to prove Coach wrong. Now, I'll say this, Perk. Ultimately, if you want to say, yeah, do I think it was a good idea or not? No, because Stephen A., Perk's reaction to me is borderline. On the one hand, you would think, like, motivated. But on the other hand, it could be demoralizing. It could make dudes not want to play for that coach. So, you, so the coach has really got to watch it. He's walking a thin line. But is this, like, his Phil Jackson stuff right now where he's pushing guys' buttons? We remember Phil Jackson doing stuff like that, motivating his team in different ways through the media, almost taking shots at them. Now, he had a lot of credibility with the championships that Brad Stevens doesn't have. But Brad Stevens has been around a while. He's been a successful coach, and he's trying some psychological tactics here, Perk. That's it. Yeah, yeah, whatever, man. And you know what's the more you know what's even more disturbing right now is that two guys that I respect that go from the old school that I always talk about the old school, the generation of of players being soft, and it goes along with the coaches. I know one thing, Stephen A. When you was covering uh, Allen Iverson, you never heard the great Larry Brown go on record and say anything like crazy like this. He was oh. always a competitor. Am oh. I right? Am oh. I right? You are wrong. Uh, You're very, very wrong. Ask Larry Brown used to go like this. Oh, you know, I just don't know, Stephen. We, I mean, I don't know what kind of chance we're going to have here, Stephen. We're just going to have to do everything right because, I mean, with the odds are stacked against us, Stephen, I just don't know. He used to do that all the time. Yeah, but that's – All the time. Yeah, but that's – Good Iverson. And yeah, Allen used to do that, ah, whatever. That, <laughs> yeah, Because they all wouldn't have it. completely – that, that's a completely different thing about us being stacked against us and having a one-on-one and then coming out and saying, it, I would have a hard time seeing them lose. I saw Not Mike Malone either. last year. I saw Mike Malone last year against the Clippers, right, when he was down in the series. You remember he kept saying nationally, he kept telling us nationally that, oh, we ain't packing no bags because we ain't going nowhere. We going to another game. Oh, yeah, we got plans on winning this game. Like, that's the coach you want to ride with. I don't know what y'all trying to rock well, with, let me say, but I don't want to hear my coach saying that type of stuff. I'm I, sorry. I, 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 At the end of the day, stuff. I'm trying to go to war with somebody that want to stir the pot, that's right. letting them know that we coming in as soldiers and right. we going to war. Whether we win, lose, or draw, this is what it's about to be. It's about to be, it's about to be a dog well, he, fight. Kendrick Perkins, yes, Kendrick Perkins, I will remind you that a Allen Iverson, uh, against the Houston Rockets, Stevie Franchise, Steve Francis, Coutinho Mobley and those boys. Allen Iverson goes on the court and drops 58 points. And they interview Larry Brown after the game, and Larry Brown was like, you know, he could have he could have made that pass to that open man, and he could have done and he could have done this. I mean, I'm just telling you, there are some coaches that's the, that that's just a tactical maneuver on their part. It does yeah. happen. Yeah, you look, know Perk, that. all he really basically said was what, what, what Stephen A. just said Larry Brown used to do. He said, if I were a fan, in other words, if I was looking from the outside and I looked at that Nets roster, I would think these cats in Boston don't have a chance. And so how did he end it? He basically said, therefore, we're going to have to do everything right. We're going to have to play the right way. He didn't, dis he didn't count out his team. Well, let me ask you all a question then, because we've been on here time and time again. Right when when it comes down to Brad Stevens and asking ourselves, why is this team underachieving? Why is this team underachieving? You had a Jalen Brown and a Jason Tatum, two All Stars, right, that are under the age of 25 and they're going to continue to rise. Jason Tatum has taken the leap into superstardom, and we come on here time and time again and ask. Why are these guys not achieving and why they why they are in the position that they are in right now when this is the same team that went to the Eastern Conference Finals? And we come on here all the time and we ask, is it Brad Stevens? Is he not lighting a fire under these guys? I mean, I didn't, this is not the first time I didn't hear Brad come on here and say something crazy, right? They, they're playing in the game to, to, to try to get the sixth seed about a week ago, and he came in and he said, Oh, our guys just wasn't engaged at the start of the game. What do you mean? What do you mean? It was against the Miami Heat. What do you mean our, our guys just wasn't engaged? How are y'all not engaged knowing that if y'all beat the Miami Heat, y'all can secure a, a, a place at the sixth seed and lock in a, a seed at the, in the postseason? How are you not engaged? Tell me that. That falls on coaching. Well, Perk, that's How what, is your well, Perk, team that's not engaged? 
That's why I brought up Phil Jackson, because that's the type of stuff Phil Jackson would do. Phil would be like, listen, these dudes got to figure it out. If it's not important, he had, he had sometimes yeah, when it was Max, going but bad. That's where, I lose, that's where you lose me, Max. I he get, did the same listen, sort of I don't give it, yeah, I don't want to hear, hear a damn word about Phil Jackson when we talk about Brad Stevens. Those are two completely no, different categories. But, but the point is, there's a model of success who had that basic oh, strategy yeah. at times before. And when you talk about, per, keep when you talk about why are they in the position or, or, that they're in, why they have to play in a playing game, it's real simple. Kemba got hurt, and then COVID and health and safety protocols destroyed the roster a lot of the season. That's what happened. By Max, the way, the Lakers Max, were in a playing game for similar reasons. Max, right. you, time, Max you are so wrong. Molly, he is so wrong. He, he, he don't even know half of the story. He's so Max, wrong, I'm he's sitting right? up here watching the game. I'm watching the game on a late night when they're playing against an Oklahoma City Thunder team that had just lost 14 straight, and they in a must-win situation, and Oklahoma coming in, in the garden and beat them. They were healthy right, we there, Max. Go. Like, we need, to, we need to see Jason Tatum and Kemba me. play like they did in their last game. That's what we need to see. Big Perk, you sit tight. I need you Brad a little later in the show. Passes, man. All right. All right, Raptor superfan Nav Batia is the first fan inducted into the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame. Stephen A., should a fan be inducted into the Hall of Fame? Hell no. How do we define what a great fan is? Your Hall of Famer, how is that defined exactly? What's the criteria? What's the standard? How many, how many games you've attended? Who you talk to when you're there? How, how much, how, 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 how vehement you are when you get up and go off uh, towards the opponent? The fan participation, I, I don't know how you measure that. So, no, I don't agree with it. All right. Uh, Eagles' Jalen Hurts has said he's not above a quarterback competition in Philadelphia. Max, where do you rank Hurts in the NFC East quarterback race? Look, I suspect he's number three right now, mm -hmm. but he has to go out there and prove it. Right now, he has to be considered fourth. He has not shown on an NFL field with any consistency, he hasn't had a lot of reps, that he's better than Fitzpatrick, right? Like, he hasn't shown that yet. Who's been a decent low-end starter at times throughout his career, or at least an excellent backup. I suspect he'll be better by the end of this season or by the middle of this season. But as of right now, Dak, Daniel Jones, Patrick, and then him. All right, here we go, fellas. After an eight-year layoff, Tim Tebow is back in the NFL. He signed his contract this morning with the Jacksonville Jaguars. He'll be on the field today for the team's off-season program. As he sets out to compete for a roster spot at tight end, Tebow has told those around him, that he knows the challenge that is ahead of him, as usual, he embraces it. Bless you, Stephen A. Tebow had this to say. I want to thank the Jaguars for the opportunity to compete and earn a chance to be a part of this team. I know it will be a challenge, but it is a challenge I embrace. I am dedicated to taking the direction of our coaching staff and learning from my teammates. I appreciate everyone's support as I embark on this new journey. Max, yeah. do you have a problem? With the Jags signing Tim Tebow. I do not have a problem with the Jags signing Tim Tebow, nor do I think he needs to apologize for the opportunity. Tim Tebow is one of the greatest college players of all time. His college coach is now the head coach for Jacksonville, which is his hometown, by the way. And he is an enormous celebrity in the media. And everyone always said, well, he's a great athlete. He could be a good football player, just not quarterback. Okay, so they're giving him a shot at another position. By the way, he still has to make the team. I will say this, however, Stephen A., a lot of people have used Tebow's situation to discuss Colin Kaepernick, to link the two somehow. I don't think they're linked, but I will say this. I think it's good to do that. I think it is good to use anyone who gets an opportunity, if, especially if you feel like they don't deserve it, to, or they haven't earned it, or others are more worthy, to use that as a chance to bring up the fact that Kaepernick hasn't even been given a tryout. No one has even looked at him. And I would say, Stephen A., that it would be nice for Tim Tebow, who has been given this opportunity, you don't have to apologize for it, but it would be nice for him to say, to mention Kaepernick's name, to say, hey, I've been given this opportunity, a lot of people are upset about it, I'm very grateful for it. You know, Colin Kaepernick should also get a look. I know the two aren't linked, but I like linking them, and I think Tebow should too. I have a problem with it. And in the interest of full disclosure, um, I texted Tim Tebow a couple of weeks ago, and I told him that if anybody deserves, you know, something along this line, it's him. Just from a human perspective, I think that he's one of the great, great people 
uh, that I've had the pleasure of meeting in this business. Um, he's a really, really good dude. His heart's in the right place. He's very charitable and philanthropic with his intentions and his actions. Um, he's a pillar of that community, especially. Uh, was a star at Florida State, et cetera, et cetera. And so I'm happy for him, meaning Tim Tebow specifically. But when you look at, you know, just the totality of the situation, um, once again, if I'm going to bring up white privilege when I talk about when I brought up Steve Nash getting the job in Brooklyn, is this not an example of white privilege? What brother you know is getting this opportunity? Now, that makes people uncomfortable because we're talking about race. When I say something like that, let me be the first to say, I don't give a damn how you feel. I mean what I say. It is white privilege because that's not something that's happening for any brothers out there. You've never played the position. You've been retired from the game for years. When you did play, you were a quarterback on the NFL level, which you were not that good at. You had an opportunity when you were an active participant as an NFL player to participate and play tight end, play special teams and stuff like that, but you wanted to be a quarterback. And now here you are in this position. Why do I bring that up? That's not the point to figure at Tim Tebow. It's to remind everybody is that this opportunity doesn't happen if Urban Meyer is not the coach of the Jacksonville Jaguars. Jacksonville Jaguars were 1-16 last, 1-15 last year. They absolutely stunk. You, as far as I'm concerned, you could have gotten an equipment manager to play for that squad as bad as they look, okay? They didn't think about calling Tim Tebow then. They didn't think about calling Tim Tebow the year before that uh, when they were having their problems. But all of a sudden, Urban Meyer comes there. And as a result, Tim Tebow gets the job, gets an opportunity, rather, to, 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 to get a job with the Jacksonville Jaguars. He got that job because of the relationships. And as I've stated on many, many occasions on this show, when George Floyd ultimately was murdered by Derek Chauvin, the cop, and you saw people rioting and protesting in the streets, it wasn't just about him. It was about the symbolism of what transpired because black people have repeatedly felt like we have the proverbial knee on our neck. We don't have, we constantly have to scratch and claw our way. And when we see someone of a different ilk, of a different ethnicity, getting opportunities we know we would never get. That's where the word white privilege comes, the words white privilege come from. And you yourself, Max, have been on the record. And I saw you saying this to somebody a couple of weeks ago when I wasn't on the show. You were talking about how white privilege needs to be addressed, but you're about lifting everybody up. You're not about giving up your white privilege, et cetera, et cetera. And my response to that months ago when I had that conversation with you is that if you have a 50-yard head start and you get to race and we're both going at the same speed, I could never catch you. In other words, there's no way to eradicate white privilege without white individuals giving up some of their privilege. And the reality point. is, is that Urban Meyer is in a position where he can exercise. I'm not saying he did it for Tim Tebow because he was white or anything like that. It has nothing to do with it race in, in regards to that. I'm simply saying, when you see an opportunity like that happen, it is clear that it happens for white folks, and it doesn't happen for everybody else. What I would that's say, problematic. Steve, Stephen A., I think that's an interesting point. The reason I say you need to lift up instead of ask people to kind of step down is this is human nature. The people living their one and only life, you know, sure. if they're given an opportunity, are usually... By and large, most people are not passing that up because of some larger social issue that may be abstract to them, I'm right? Saying, so I'm because saying. that is the reality, then I think the best course of action is to lift up. When I say to you something like when you were uh, protesting the, the process, because you said a black GM would never be given the latitude yeah. to tank for a number of seasons. Correct. My point is not to say, therefore, no one should be able to if it's a good strategy. We can debate that another time. Right. My point is just insist. Then it's, a, then it's incumbent upon those who are privileged, mm -hmm. privileged to mm -hmm. insist that everyone mm -hmm. is given that latitude and, and shown the respect of the human being to make the best hold decision. Hold on. This I, is an important I, I, question. Let me get in here, Stephen A. How do they insist it? How are you going to insist it? So if, if other people aren't well, getting the right opportunity. For example, on this show, we discuss 
uh, African-American coaches. And Stephen A. will talk about the paucity of African-American coaches and, and use this as a platform to address it and bring pressure to bear on the league. I, I lend my voice to that every single time, absolutely. And we'll oftentimes and, bring that up as an issue independently right. because it's an important one. And I appreciate the fact that you do that more than you'll ever know. And I've always given you credit for that, Max. The only thing I've ever challenged is that you know that's not going to happen. In other words, when you talk about people surrendering their privileged positions and insisting that others get lifted up, you know they can insist all they want to, but if it doesn't coincide with folks surrendering some of their privilege, the level of progress that we aspire to have is not going to happen. And so I what I'm what saying, saying is, I'm saying it's not going to happen. So in the end, what it comes down to is this. If you look at a guy like an Urban Meyer, because I want to stay on course here with Tim Tebow, I love Tim Tebow. I truly do as a person. I really do. And I'm wishing him nothing but the best. And he knows that, and I'm not rooting against him. But it didn't go unnoticed when you saw Marcus Spears, when you saw Ryan Clark, when you saw Damian Woody and a host of other individuals. It didn't it didn't escape any of us that all of these African-Americans that were speaking, even though they didn't go where I'm going, they made sure to remind everybody this wasn't an opportunity earned. Tim Tebow has a relationship with Urban Meyer. And because he has that relationship, years removed from football, having never played the position, here he comes and he finds himself in a position in his mid-30s to try to play a position that people have toiled and worked and scratched and clawed their way just to try to get that opportunity. He's but getting it because of his relationship. And it's not something that black people can brag about. Because those opportunities do not happen for us. And I'm focusing. I hear you. I hear you. I think those are very good points. And I'm, what I'm focusing on is Tebow himself. The reality is once that opportunity is presented, the individual will go almost always take it for themselves. He themself. should go for it, yeah. Therefore, and then what? That's why I'm saying whether or not there's a Kaepernick link, here's something Tebow can do. Insist on the link. Say, hey, I'm getting this opportunity for reasons other than just purely football. There's a guy right now very visibly being kept out, shut out of opportunity fine, not for reasons other than football. Right. It's not going to amount. You're right, but it's not going to amount to anything, and you know it's not going to amount to anything. I don't know about that. I don't know. Yeah, you do. It's All not right. going to well, amount to let anything. Me, let me just say this really quickly here because it's also a novel idea. I think it's important to use our platform and talk about these issues, and I'm grateful that we do that on the show. But – Everyone, especially people with a platform and privilege, need to do more than just talk about it. What are you doing in the community? Where is your money going? Where is your time and energy? So there needs to be action steps beyond just chatter. And that's how things really start to move and shake. Let's leave it there. Uh, it's the first we've seen of. You know, it's been a while since we've been in postseason. It's been a while since we had one of those type of every possession count games. James puts up the three. Oh, it's good. We got one postseason game under our belt. We we'll look forward to the next one. We have to find that, that swag again, find our swag, knowing that we're the defending champion. Nothing's going to be easy for us because we do have a target on our back and every team wants to beat us. So, you know, this is going to be a challenge. Uh, we accept the challenge. Let's go! Let's go! After last night's game where we saw the Warriors, who were heavy underdogs, take the Lakers to the brink without Klay Thompson, while LeBron and Anthony Davis were on the court, LeBron's epic three secured. That shot really was ridiculous. Securing the seventh seed for the Lakers in first round matchup versus the Suns. Big Perk is back. All right, I will start with, uh, I'll start with you here, Stephen A. Are you feeling better or worse about the Lakers repeating? Worse. Um, I just uh, – I didn't think that LeBron looked the same in the first half. Um, I saw Anthony Davis struggling. I questioned their durability. I questioned their three-point shooting outside of Contavious Caldwell Pope. And I questioned their free-throw shooting, particularly because the ball is in LeBron James' hands and he's a 73% career shooter. And I think that when you're going up against some of these teams, that's one of the problems they don't have. They make perimeter shots and they hit free-throws. And I think that that's the kind of thing you have to be concerned about, particularly with the road that the Lakers have to travel. Having to probably go on the road for each series um, against relatively physical teams, but physical teams that actually have perimeter shooters. 
Um, that's my concern, and that's what I'm worried about with them. I feel exactly the same as I did before the game. I don't think they beat a Nets big three, but I think they can get out of the West. What was obvious, like here are the questions going in. Are they going to miss Rondo, right? Because just because you're a guy like Schroeder who can perform in the regular season, can you be Rondo in the playoffs? The answer was no. Schroeder's okay. He was just a guy last night. Rondo's not just a guy in the playoffs. He's an all-star. That gives them a big three last year. They don't have that this year. On the other hand, the operative word being big, the Lakers have a lot of size with guys who can play. The addition of Andre Drummond. When you have Drummond and AD and LeBron on the court, you're just going to dominate the board. You're going to get extra possessions. And we saw it last night. Lakers should have been blown out, really, in terms of shots they were missing and the way they were playing, but they were able to dominate on the glass and on the defensive end. And I think Le now, now, AD not hitting shots, LeBron, uh, Le LeBron can hit big shots. AD from the outside can do it, but last year was not typical of his career. He normally does not shoot as well from the outside as he did last year. I don't expect him to this year. He can just do his normal thing. We saw Wes Matthews come in off the bench and be a real 3 and D veteran guy who helped change the game. The Lakers has en have enough to beat the Suns, to beat the Jazz, maybe even the Clippers. I think those are all tough series. I don't think they have enough shooting, Stephen A., to beat the Nets. But that's the only team I think they simply don't have enough to beat. Well, I actually feel better about the game from last night, about the Lakers and the way that they played last night. And here's why. I mean, they played horrible offensively, but they still got the win. And second of all, they're not going to go against the Steph Curry every single night. Nobody in the league is playing like Steph Curry. He's the toughest player in the league to guard. I don't care what you said about Kevin Durant, James Harden, Kyrie Irving, anybody, Giannis, you can name them all, Jason Tatum. Right now, Steph Curry is the hardest person to guard in the NBA. The way he moves without the basketball, the way that you have to trap him, the way that he's able to get to the basket, split double teams. I mean, he's just a magician right now, and he, this is why I say he's the best player in the league. That's one thing. They're not going to play against him. Second thing, Max, listen. Draymond Green guards Anthony Davis better than anyone I've ever saw, right, and ever seen. When I was with the Pelicans and we went up against the Golden State Warriors, I watched Draymond Green give Anthony Davis fits. Anthony Davis is not going to see Draymond Green anymore. He's going to see other bigs that he's going to dominate like he did last year in the bubble. Dennis Schroeder, Stephen A., on Stephen A. Sports Center, you remember I called him out, I said he won $100 million. It was his time to step up and show it. I still stand by that. But then I give him somewhat of a pass for last night because he is coming out of the COVID situation, right? And a lot of players have said that it's taking them a minute. They don't know. Some days they feel good. Some days they feel like they have a headache or a concussion or whatever the case may be. They have different symptoms, and they don't – like Jason Tatum said, it took a month for him to get back to where he originally was feeling great, right? But the Lakers' defense was so on point last night in the second half. It was a beautiful thing to watch playing boxes and elbows, helping the helper, taking away driving ga gaps, getting deflections. You know what happens when your shots are not falling? Then you force turnovers and get out in transition. That's what the Lakers done last night. So when I look at the Lakers defense, I'm looking at a guy like Alex Caruso who came in and who was being a pest to Steph Curry, right, down the stretch. You look at a guy like Wes Matthews. The Lakers have so much depth that they could go to different guys and Frank Vogel could search out different guys to plug in the rotation to give them life. Kyle Kuzma actually played well on the defensive end last night. So the Lakers' defense is just so good that the nights that they are struggling offensively, they're going to win games because of their defense. Well, I agree with you about their defense, but I will say this. Last night is not exactly uh, the ideal litmus test per se because the Golden State Warriors are obviously shorthanded without Klay Thompson. When you go up against the Phoenix, when you got Devin Booker and Chris Paul to deal with, along with DeAndre Ayton, who has been getting better and better, and you and I were talking after the Sports Center with Stephen A. show last night, mm -hmm. uh, K KP, and you saw what our man Michael Wilbon was telling us about what was going on in Phoenix. So you got that going on. You see the Utah Jazz, and you see the way they can shoot the ball, plus they have size, plus they have uh, uh, an elite defensive team as well. We can't ignore that. 
Uh, so when you pay attention to those kind of things, and then, of course, there is the Clippers because we can say what we want, but there's still a threat. Kawhi Leonard is still there. Paul George is still mm-hmm. there. Um, Ty Lue knows what he's doing, and he knows and he knows LeBron James as well because he went to three straight finals with LeBron James as his head coach and won a championship. So he'd have a clue. And plus, they picked up Rondo, who also knows and is also a brilliant cerebral point guard come postseason time. And so when you look at it from that perspective, I don't think that last night – was the ideal litmus test to judge what we've seen from the Lakers because they've got toughest competition down the road just based on bodies alone. The other thing is it's hard to get out of your mind that without LeBron James, AD just dominated Denver and then also Phoenix without LeBron James, and that was recently. So I'm not doubting AD's dominance, Perk. What I was addressing was what Stephen A. said about the shooting. A.D. was shooting from the outside throughout the playoffs last year at a a level he's never hit from before. He was hitting outside shots last year unlike he normally does. That's what I'm saying. I don't expect that to be the case this year just because it had never been before. Unless he's one of those guys who could just elevate his shot in the clutch. There aren't that many of those guys, but maybe he's one of them. But unless that's the case, the Lakers are going to feel the fact that they don't shoot it particularly well as the playoffs go on. Max, AD been knocking down mid-range jumpers since he came into the NBA, man. I'm what are three. you talking about? I like, mean, from three. I, okay, like, okay, he, he, okay, threes. Okay, he added that to his game. But when you say jump shots, you have to clarify what are you talking about because Anthony the, Davis the came into the NBA knocking shoot. down mid-range jump shots. Yeah, that's, I'm talking that's about from his outside. Game. So from outside means three. I mean, from three. That, no, 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 it don't. No, jump what are you shot. talking about? When In, you say outside, outside, outside that don't. In, in today's is a jump NBA, shot. Anything outside the paint. In today, right, I understand. But in today's NBA, if you're talking about stretching, if you're talking about like a stretch four or five, you're talking about a guy who can hit from, from the perimeter, from three-point land. That's no, what just, AD was doing No, last you're talking year. about people that can shoot outside the paint 15 to 17. We just had Chris Bosh on first take the other day who's inducted into the Hall of Fame. Uh, Max Kellerman, he was a specialist at the 15 to 17-foot jump shot, okay. not let just three-point range. I don't want to get bogged down on this. Let me be clear. Right, well, just let me be clarify. clear. That's all we let ask me, you to let do. Let me clarify. Don't try to reinvent rules. Let, let me clarify. AD <laughs> last year was hitting from three <laughs> Unlike he had previously in his career, he was taking them and he was hitting them. And Stephen A., when you say they don't have enough shooting, what I thought you meant was from outside, meaning the perimeter, meaning three-point land. Because in modern NBA, we know that the that the way you convert from three is practically the same as a mid-range, which is why everyone takes threes because you get an extra point. And if you don't do that enough, it's extremely hard to win. I think the Lakers have enough to compensate for that for the reasons you guys pointed out, the defense, the size, you know, everything else. But that will hurt them against the Nets, and it will make their their navigation through the West harder. By the way, Anthony Davis shot 33% from three-point range last year, Max. The previous two years, he shot better from three-point range. No, playoffs. In the playoffs. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up uh, this segment here by saying this really quickly. Just to be clear, stop me if I'm wrong, Max or Stephen A. Perk, you are the only one on this show picking the Lakers to repeat, correct? Yeah, I am. I am. Okay, we will leave it there. Perk, thank you for the time, as always, sir. Uh, there's more Lakers talk. You. After 22 women accused him of varying degrees of sexual misconduct and battled Texans quarterback Deshaun Watson seemingly broke his silence yesterday, Posting video of him working out. We haven't heard from Watson since his last formal statement. That was back on March 16th. Max, what is your reaction to Deshaun Watson uh, working out on Instagram? Well, as you said, we haven't heard from him in a while. And I already know he's a great football player. Deshaun Watson is a great quarterback. He's one of the best quarterbacks in the league. So, okay, he's working out. You know, this is not a court of law where the standard of proof The burden of proof is on the person making the accusation, and the standard of proof is high, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, This is really more about the court of public opinion. And if it was one one woman or one or two or a handful even 
making an accusation, you would think, well, and he's claiming or his lawyer would claim, well, it's a, some sort of a conspiracy. You think, well, uh, you know, like, let's see the facts come out. When there are 22 different women making a very, simil very similar claims about Deshaun Watson, then in the court of public opinion, that's what we're interested in hearing addressed, not the football of it, because I find it hard to believe he's going to be able to get out on a football field this year for the NFL in the NFL if he doesn't address that. So he's working out. Tell me something I don't know. You're good at football. No, tell me something I don't know. Tell me some kind of a response to 22 women making virtually the same or a very similar accusation. There's no disagreement here. Um, <clears throat> even though this is a debate show, this is not something that um, is debatable, to be quite honest with you. Um, you're Deshaun Watson. I respectfully ask this question, and I say respectfully because he's innocent until proven guilty. Uh, these are allegations that have been levied against him. Um, and that's all we know right now. Doesn't look good. With the smoke, there's fire, as some people would say. Walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it ain't a mongoose. You got 22 different women accusing you of similar uh, heinous acts. There's no question uh, that, that that's something that needs to be probed into and investigated and what have you. And he doesn't look very good right now. To know that's what's going on, to know that you have basically been unseen, and to put out a workout video right now, I'm not going to lie. I don't think that was smart. Yeah. Because it gives the impression, it gives the impression that you don't really have any concerns. That's for your lawyer to handle. Well, that's not how it works when you have that amount of allegations levied against you. The reality is, is that the NFL, just based on the accusations alone, and the rules stipulated in their collective bargaining agreement, Commissioner Roger Goodell, literally, without any kind of criminal indictments or anything leveled against Deshaun Watson, he could literally say, you ain't playing football until further notice in the National Football League because you have impugned the shield with all of these accusations coming out. If we put you on the field for this upcoming 2021 NFL season, we will be excoriated. There's no way around this. We can't let you out on the field. And to know that that's your reality, because he knows that, and to put out a workout video, but we haven't seen a single press conference. We haven't even seen you walk in the streets with a camera in front of you and addressed any of these allegations that have been levied against you. I know your lawyer's probably advising you not to say anything, and I totally get that part. But because of the amount of allegations leveled against you, if you ain't going to say anything, don't say anything and don't be seen. Just go ahead and do what you got to do. But don't go out and give the impression that somebody else is handling this and you got your mindset on playing football. When you know you play for a league and in a league that is overseen by a commissioner who can literally today based on the allegations alone, go to the Players Association and go to you personally and say, here's your money, but you will now be on the commissioner's exempt list. You will not be playing football for the 2021 season. Roger Cadell could do that right now. And knowing that, and you still going to put out a video with you working out and getting yourself. I mean, I know he's going to work out. I got to keep himself in shape because it's possible he could play and he's got to be ready. Please, I'm not saying he shouldn't be working out. I'm saying for that to be the public image that you've disseminated at a time like this, I don't know who advised him to do that, but it wasn't smart. Yeah. Um, Max, what you said was spot on. Stephen A., you as well. I will just add one uh, four words here as the female on the show. It feels tone deaf. That's what it feels to me. We'll leave it there. Uh, Chef Curry did all he could do, but Stephen A. has some thoughts on the Warriors moving forward. Dub Nation, you won't want to miss what he's got to say next right here on First Take. Plus, it's LeBron James. 
All right, with last night's loss to the Lakers, the Warriors will now have to regroup and face the Young Grizzlies in a win-or-go-home game tomorrow night. Monica McNutt, our basketball analyst extraordinaire, joining us. First time I've gotten to be on the show with you. Hello, lady. How are we doing today? Thank you for being with us. I'm well, Molly. Hey, Max. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course. Good to be on with a rising star. Every time you read something about Monica, she is a rising star. Yes. Great on TV. <laughs> great, great personality. No question. I've been watching you. I'm going to start with uh, Max here, though. Max, how do you feel about the Warriors in this particular game against the Grizz? I think they got their work cut out for them. You know, like everyone, when they looked at the Grizzlies and Spurs, was talking John Morant, but it was Valanciunas who was the real problem. And I think they have their work cut out for them. Um, Steph Curry has been playing at a very high level. And I do think that when push comes to shove, he will be clearly the best player on the floor and will decide the outcome, and the Warriors will win. Um, I think that Wiggins especially has shown that he can be a real two-way force, and Draymond Green was a beast defensively. But I don't see this as a gimme. I see this as a tough game for the Warriors. Max, I actually agree that this is going to be a tough game, and I'm actually on the other side of this coin. I actually believe that the Grizzlies will be able to pull this one out tonight. I'm really, really excited to see one Dylan Brooks do his best job in terms of slowing down Steph Curry, who obviously is the supreme X factor in this narrative. But I really think, I agree with you, Valanchunas, 23-23 and 23 in the first play-in game. He's a guy that averages a double-double. He's averaging 19 and about 14 rebounds, I believe, against the Warriors in particular. I just think, considering what happened to this Grizzlies unit last year and the youth, I know sometimes youth can be a double-edged sword, but I actually think in this instance, not only does the youth benefit them, but the fact that they just saw this team to finish out the regular season, I think we're going to see a different outcome than we did in the regular season. Mm. Stephen A., where are you on this? Um, I'm going with Steph Curry. I'm going with Steph Curry. And, and I, at some point in time, John Morant can't get, you know, he's got to step up. And, and, and when he's, I mean, he had 35 in a closeout game against Portland last year in the bubble. We know what he's capable of doing. I'm not taking anything away from him. And I, too, am a fan of Dylan Brooks. I like Dylan Brooks a lot. I like I like how he goes after it. I like how he competes. Um, and he can play. He, and Valanchunas had 23 rebounds uh, last night. Let's not forget that. 23 points, 23 rebounds. So he's a big who plays big. And that could be problematic for an undersized uh, Golden State Warriors team. But I think that when the game is going to be in San Francisco, when you're talking about Steph being on his home turf, when you're talking about him being the shooter that he is and what he brings to the table, I think that potentially could be too much for the Grizzlies to overcome in this particular situation, especially with the way that they played last night, Golden State played last night. Remember, it wasn't good enough to beat the Lakers, but that would have been good enough to beat the Grizzlies. Yeah, I mean, I mean, DeMar DeRozan was missing everything. And if that's Steph Curry taking those shots, those are going in. And they're going in from three. I, I think in the end, the best player on the floor determines series like this. And I think in this game, that's Steph Curry by a factor of something. I'm not going to disagree with you guys on Steph being the best player, but I do have a slightly different perspective on the toll that both initial games took on both of these teams. I think the Warriors put out their best effort and came up short. I think that they have a tougher challenge in terms of bouncing back, yes, it is at home in the Chase Center, than an upstart Grizzly squad who played terrific against the San Antonio Spurs. I just think momentum's on their side. It feels like if there was ever going to be a year where one of the younger teams kind of took one from an established superstar, feels like this is the moment to me. Uh, that, that would be bad for Steph, guys. If they, like, you know, you would think that this is just a gravy year for Steph because, you know, the team has been really hurt by injury and anything he accomplishes is to his credit and whatever they come up short is not his fault and all that. But at this point, you push the Lakers to the brink. The Lakers are favored to get out of the West. They're favored against the number two Suns by a lot, right, by the second-seeded Suns by a lot. And at this point, I actually think if that's the case, Monica, then Steph actually does have something to lose. I think it I think it takes some luster off his season if he can't lead this team through the winner of the 9-10 game. I think that's actually bad for Steph. 
Well, listen, I'll tell you this. Monica does give me cause to pause because she knows what she's talking about. And by the way, keep doing the great job that you've been doing, girl. I've been watching. Uh, having said all of that, Thank you. I'm still <laughs> going to disagree with you respectfully <laughs> on this particular one uh, because I think that there's levels to this. And I think that when we look at the Memphis Grizzlies, you know, one of those teams that's just got talent and they're tough and they're going to scratch and they're going to fight and they're going to be there and they're not an easy out but you know they're going down anyway. That's what the Grizzlies always give you the impression of when it really, really counts. It's like last year watching them in the bubble when they went up against Dame and, and the Blazers. I just said, I'm looking at them. Great game. It was a great game down to the wire. But somehow, somewhere, even with John Morant doing what he did, you just knew that Dame and CJ would find a way because it was Memphis that they were going against. And that's the kind of feeling that you have thinking about Memphis about to go up against Steph Curry and Golden State. And let's not forget Jordan Poole, who the Warriors are very, very high on. They're excited about his prospects and what he's going to bring to the table. Uh, even when Klay Thompson comes back, the fact that you've got him in the mix, they're excited about him. Andrew Wiggins showed up last night. What if he does that again? What if he gives you another 21? What if he plays the exceptional defense that he's played? Who's that guy? Who's that closer? And just weeks ago, Monica, you know this. Uh, John, John Morant was in a game, I think it was against the Warriors, but I'm not sure, where he was so disgusted with himself because they had backed off of him and dared him to shoot jump shots. Doris Burke was talking to me about that last night. So I think about that, and John Morant is electrifying, great athlete, finisher, got a lot of heart reigning rookie of the year, but at some point in time, particularly in the playoffs, when defense is slow, they get back and they turn you into a half-court team, even though even though Memphis is accustomed to that. You got to be able to hit perimeter shots, especially against De Steph yeah. Curry, and if you don't do that, it could cost you. You're not wrong, Stephen A. Um, and in fact, in that regular season game, job was 7 of 21. Woo. He definitely has to be able to hit shots, but I don't know, y'all. And this Basketball analysis aside, I just think this Memphis team is young. They're gritty. They were in this spot last year. I love the way Jaron Jackson has returned to the floor. I think if he can hit shots throughout the course of the game against the Spurs, he was hot early and kind of went a little bit quiet. I just think that they're playing with house money. And I heard you guys discussing Brad's comments, Brad Stevens' comments about the Celtics and the Nets matchup. To me, it's the same kind of deal, right? Like, internally... We know that this is a behemoth of a task. We fully understand what the Warriors represent and how hot Steph Curry has been. But I just feel like this could be the moment. I, I tell you what, in terms of a young team that could knock off a giant, I think this is it. I don't, see, I don't think we see it anywhere else in the playoffs. All right, fair enough. We'll leave it on that note. Monica McNutt, great stuff as always. Thank you so much for being with us. Have a fabulous day. Thank All you. Right. When we come back here on First Take, Max Kellerman has a Steph Curry.